to a place called Mount Moriah. Abraham took Isaac, for God had said his son would have to die. But in this time of testing, they both received a blessing. For a ram was slain in Isaac's place, and grace came down, and Abraham knew why. With the wood upon his back, the sun climbed up the hill, prepared to die. the story of redemption, of death and resurrection, the altar, the Father and the Son. To a place they call Mount Calvary, Jesus Christ was destined He'd pay for all the wrongs that men had done. While on the cross suspended, knowing his life would soon be ended, though God would turn his face away, the victory came for the Father and the Son. The sun climbed up the hill, prepared to die. With the Father looking on, he knew his son would be the holy sacrifice. Still he kept on climbing, determined that his father's will be done that's a story of redemption of death and resurrection the altar the father and the son the cross became an altar a sacrifice for the father and the son
is a powerful picture of our wonderful Lord. And he's a powerful picture of a climbing, unstoppable, undefeatable, life-giving vine. I want you to turn with me once again to the 49th chapter of the book of Genesis. And this is Jacob's blessing upon his son Joseph. And listen to what he says about him beginning at verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough or a fruitful vine, even a fruitful vine by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd and the stone of Israel. And so we're going to notice together that Joseph is a beautiful and powerful picture of Jesus the vine. I want you to write down beside of these verses here in the 49th chapter of Genesis, verses 22 through 24, John chapter 15 at verse 1. And Jesus said, I am the true vine. And not only do we need 15 and 1, we also need the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John at verse 5. And Jesus said, I am the vine and you're the branches. And he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now listen once again. I am the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And that was proven even to Joseph's brothers. It was proven to them that without Joseph, they were going to die in the time of famine. And without him, they could do absolutely nothing. Let's go back to the 45th chapter of Genesis for just a moment. And let me show you what I'm talking about. This is the chapter of reconciliation. This is the chapter of reunion. It had been 17 years since Joseph's brothers had sold him into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. And now Joseph is the prime minister of all of Egypt. He is seated at the right hand of all power. He's been given a name in Egypt that is above every other name, Zephanath Paneah, or bow the knee. And now his brothers, they come to stand before him. And listen to what happens in verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by. And he cried and caused every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. And I want you to keep your eyes on that word L I L. F-E, for these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth. And then look at verse 11. This is when Joseph, he begins to promise them to be a pastor to them. He gives them encouraging promises and infallible proofs. And then look at verse 11. And there will I nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. I will nourish you. And then look at verse 16. And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house saying, Joseph's brethren are come, and it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, laid your beast, and go, and get you into the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will, and I will, 
and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt. Now remember that Jesus, he's that unstoppable, he is that undefeated, climbing, life-giving vine. I am the vine, and you're the branches. And he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me... Ye can do nothing. And Joseph was telling his very own brothers that sold him into slavery, except you come to Egypt and abide in me, and I'm abiding in you, you're going to perish in the time of this great famine. And dear friend, right now, we are living in a famine for the Word of God. And except we abide in Christ, and Christ is at home and abides in us, we're not going to bear any fruit. And we need to understand that without Him, we can do absolutely nothing. Listen again to verse 22 of the 49th chapter. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful vine by well, whose branches run over the wall. They've tried to stop him. They've tried to defeat him. But Joseph is that undefeated, unstoppable climbing vine that is always moving toward the water. Again, I am the true vine, John 15 and 1. And again, John 15 and 5, I am the vine, you the branches. And he that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Let's go over to the Gospel of John. And let me set just a little background. I want you to see several sets of sevens that we find in the Gospel of John. And for every child of God that is gathered here, and for everyone that is watching by television and listening by the internet, I want you to understand that in your walk with God, you need to come back and read and study and know the great truths of the Gospel of John, and you need to do it over and over again. If we had no other record from the Lord other than the Gospel of John, we could make it on the Gospel of John. And then we need to understand the Gospel of John so well. If something happened that all of our Bibles were taken away from us, that we could actually get together and we could converse one with another and we could pretty well rewrite the 21 chapters of the Gospel of John. You're saying, preacher, that's absolutely impossible. Well, I tell you, there's suffering Christians all around the world and they are absolutely abiding in the vine and the vine is abiding in them and they are memorizing, they are committing the Gospel of John to their hearts and to their memories because they're living under the threat that their Bibles might be taken away from them and they want to be able to get together and converse and fellowship in the great truths of the gospel of John. Let me mention some of these sets of sevens that we find in the gospel of John and then we'll come to how that Joseph said to them and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt. First of all there is a set of seven I am statements that Jesus gives in the Gospel of John. And again, if I didn't know anything else about Jesus and I had these seven I am statements, I could live my Christian life on these seven I am statements. It begins in John chapter 6 at verse 35. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. That's two of them. And then when you arrive in, over in the ninth chapter, the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, you've got two I am statements. In verse 9, he says, I am the door. And then in verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. And then when you come to John chapter 11, you got 25 through 27, and Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And then you come to John chapter 15, I am the vine and ye are the branches. And so there we have the seven I am statements that Jesus gives us. I am the very same name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. And Moses said, and whom will I say you sent me? 
And God said, you just tell Pharaoh, I am that I am. Simply signifying, I always have been, I always will be. There's no beginning to me. There's no end to me. I am self-existent. I am eternal. I am independent. I am sovereign. I stand all upon my own. I'm in need of nothing, and I'm in need of no one I am that I am. And so Jesus, he takes that name because he is the same as God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Will you remember that for just a moment? Because I'm going to explain some verses of Scripture that a lot of people have struggled with for years and years, and now I've got clarity on them, and I want to give you this clear definition that we're going to see in just a few moments. Not only do we have the seven I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John, we also have seven miracles. And that's all that John chose to record, or the Holy Ghost inspired him to record. Only seven miracles. And this goes with the conclusion of why that John was writing the purpose of his letter. And that's found in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And listen to what John says. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have L-I-F-E, life through his name, the life giving vine. Joseph is going to be the life giver for the known world in the day of Joseph. And believing you might have life through his name. So in John chapter 2, he turns the water into wine. In John chapter 4, he heals the nobleman's son from a distance. In the fifth chapter of John, the man that was laid at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. And Jesus said, wilt thou be made whole? The sixth Next chapter of John, you've got two miracles. He feeds the 5,000, and then he walks on the water, and he calms the storm all at the very same time. And then the next miracle is the ninth chapter. This is my favorite one. I love this one the best. This is the healing of the man that was born blind. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they just kept on questioning and interrogating the man after he had received his sight. And I love what he said. I'm telling you, I just enjoy this so much. He finally turned to the Pharisees and said, do you want to hear it one more time because you're choosing to believe on him? Is that the reason you want to hear this again? And boy, it just absolutely infuriated them. When he turned to them and said, you must want to hear this one more time because now you're getting real convinced and you are desiring to believe upon him. And then in John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So the seven I am's, the seven miracles of Jesus in the gospel of John, let me go a little bit further. There are seven witnesses. This might be the most important set of sevens. There are seven witnesses in the gospel of John. And the Holy Ghost inspires John to write about them and call them to come and tell the truth and nothing but the truth. So help them God. And they did. They told the truth and nothing but the truth, and God gave them the grace to do so. And so John says, let me call the first witness. And in John chapter 1, verses 7 through 15, he calls John the Baptist. If I was in trouble and I needed a character witness, if I needed a name and a letter on a resume, if I needed a word of recommendation on my behalf, I can't think of anybody any better to call, to write a letter or to take the witness stand than that of John the Baptist. And John said, I'm not the true light, but I was sent to bear witness of the light. In the third chapter, they said, John, you must be the bridegroom. He said, you've got to be kidding. He said, the one that has the bride is the bridegroom. I'm only a friend of the bridegroom. I'm a groomsman or the best man. I'm the one that's introducing the bridegroom to the bride. And so John becomes a witness. 
And then when you get over in the fifth chapter, the scenario speeds up just a little bit. And he calls three witnesses simultaneously right on top of one another. And Jesus begins in John chapter 5 at verse 36. And he says, what about my works? Let my works testify who I am. Has there ever been another man that has worked the works that I've worked? Has there any been anyone else that's ever come along that was able to do the things that I have done? And dear friend, we can look back through the annals of history and there's never been another man that was able to do the works that Jesus has done and that's one reason his legacy, it continues even today because he was not a liar and he was not a lunatic. He proved by his works that he is Lord of all. And so not not only does he call his works, he moves on into the 37th verse and he says, let me call my father and the heavenly father will verify who I am. And the heavenly father will state to you that me and him, we're one. We're not just tight. We are actually one. We are the same person. We are the same nature. We are the same character. And again, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And so he calls John the Baptist and he calls his works and he calls the Father. And then in verse 39, he turns to those Jews and he says, you think you're so smart. You really just study the scripture because you want to point for argument or debate. And I know a lot of people like that today. The only reason they even sit up here sometime and listen to a sermon that I preach, they want to catch me in something. They're not here to learn. They're not here to glean it. They're not here to build on it. They just want to see if I'm going to make a misstatement somewhere along the way and they can run up here to me after church and they'll have a little point of debate. Or they come to me afterward and say, oh, preacher, you forgot to include this. I've only got 45 minutes. How much do you want me to include in one sermon? Like I may have never thought about that or never even considered that particular point of it. We study the scripture not to be legalistic. We study the scripture not to be a Pharisee. We study the scripture not in order to win a debate. We study the scripture so that we will be persuaded within ourselves. I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him. And then when we become fully persuaded, uh, persuaded, we're not going to be argumentative. We're just going to be natural persuaders by the way that we live and by the way that we conduct ourselves and by the way that we talk and by the way that we walk. It's going to become a persuasion in and of ourselves that we know in whom we have believed and others are going to be able to recognize Jesus in us. And so Jesus said to those Pharisees, he said, look in the scripture. You really think you know them? They are the words that speak of me. It's all about me, the entire Old Testament. In the Old Testament, I was concealed. Now in the New Testament, I'm being revealed. In the Old Testament, I was uh, prophesied. Now in the New Testament, I am personified. He said, study the scripture, they speak of me. So in the eighth chapter, and a good defense attorney always warns about this. He calls himself to the witness stand. He said, I will bear witness of myself. Oh, careful, careful. They're going to cross-examine you. They're going to get you on the witness stand and they're going to trip you up somewhere along the way. But listen to what Jesus says. After that, he declares in John 8 and 18 that he would just simply bear witness of himself. In verse 46, he says, and which of you convinceth me of sin? Now search out my life and go look at my background and look at me when I was a teenager and look at my dating life and how that I conducted myself with young women and look at the places that I went to and the groups that I was associated with and you will not find one blemish on my record. You can send the FBI to do a profile on me. You can search it out. You can Google it. You can Facebook it. I've never said anything. I've never done anything. I've never been involved in anything thing and Pilate would declare it I find no fault in this just man and Jesus could take the witness stand and turn to the world and he turns to the world even today and he declares to them and which of you can convict me and point out any sin in my life whatsoever there he is that's the one that went to Mount Moriah there he is the chief cornerstone there he is the shepherd and the stone of Israel there he is 
is the Lamb of God that came to us without blemish, walked among us without spot, gave his life a ransom, arose the third day, alive forevermore. He is the sinless, perfect Son of God that could take the witness stand and declare, which of you could ever convince me of sin? And then the sixth witness, some of y'all not writing this down, and one day when they come and take our Bibles, I'm not getting in a bomb shelter with you and trying to discuss the Gospel of John. I'm going to get me up with some people that are interested in the Word of God because I can't remember it all, and you'll be digging at me one day when trouble comes. Oh, preacher, tell me about those sevens again. Tell me about those sevens. Well, the sixth one that he calls is the Holy Spirit. And in John 15, 26, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he's not going to speak of himself. He's going to take the witness stand and he's going to testify of me. Now just a little word of warning right here because I'm supposed to rebuke and reprove and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We got people today talking more about the Holy Spirit than they're talking about Jesus. And Jesus said when he the spirit of truth has come, he's not wanting to be in the foreground. He don't want the attention. He's going to point to Jesus and he's going to testify to him and he's going to lift him up and he's going to magnify him. You know how to have a good spirit filled meeting? Talk about Jesus. Sing about Jesus. Preach about Jesus. The Holy Spirit said that's my working area. That's my workshop. That's the ground that I love to stand on because I was sent to honor him and to glorify him and to point the world to him as the only antidote and the only remedy for sin he said, I'm here to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is on the witness stand right now. And I hope and pray today that he's on the witness stand of your heart, reproving you of your unbelief. The only sin that will send you to hell at this very moment is the sin of failing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, whatever's behind that, I don't know. But that's the main sin. There's other things that aid that intellectual pride and maybe even pedigree of a sin that I've always been a Christian and maybe that little pet sin that you can't give up to be a true Christian you're holding on to it maybe it's that can of beer, maybe it's that marijuana, I don't know, maybe it's that addiction, maybe it's that pornography I don't know what might be back there but it's keeping you from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and that unbelief will be the sin that sends you to hell no matter what other little little sin might be behind it. And the Holy Spirit is reproving the world of what? Of sin and of unbelief. Why? Because they have not yet believed on the Son of God. And he's here convincing and persuading and convicting and pointing us to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then the seventh witness, John 20, 21 and 22. And he shows up in the upper room. And there the ten are gathered, and he says to them, Peace, shalom be unto you. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. And I came to be a witness. And now I'm sending you to be a witness. And all of us in this room that know him, we are supposed to be living epistles. He's supposed to be written in our heart. We're supposed to adorn the doctrine. And others need to be able to see Jesus in our lives. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. So in the Gospel of John, seven I am's. Seven miracles and seven witnesses are called to the witness stand. But I've made a new discovery. And it all goes back over there to Joseph. And I started this study. And I looked over there in the 49th chapter of where Joseph was that climbing vine. And I went immediately over to John 15. I'm the vine. You're the branches. He that abides in me and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And the Egyptians became jealous because they abode in the vine. And they grew in number, the Hebrews and the Egyptians and said, we've got to do something about all these Hebrews are just multiplying and God is blessing them and God is honoring them. Wouldn't it be wonderful today if we were abiding in Joseph Jesus to the point that the world would say, we got to do something about these Christians. And they are. They're stuffing us back in a corner. They're putting us in a bottle. They're closing down the dialogue. They don't want to hear the biblical standpoint. They don't want to hear the biblical dogma and the biblical doctrine. But I believe I'll just preach it anyway because I know that Jesus is my life 
life-giving vine. And then over in the 45th chapter, at verse 18, he says, come on down, and I will give you their seven I gives in the Gospel of John. I'd never seen these before. You might have, but I just never noticed them. Let me get number one in the next few minutes for today. Look over at John chapter 4. All seven of them are great. I don't know how to condense this. I wanted to preach about four of them at one time, and then three of them the next Sunday. But when you begin to look at them, and you compare them to that 15th chapter, and Joseph and Jesus being that unstoppable, undefeated, climbing, life-giving vine, I just didn't know where to end and where to start again. And so look with me if you would here at John chapter 4 at verse 14. He's with the woman at the well in Samaria. But whosoever <clears throat> but whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Remember again the 49th or the 45th chapter at verse 18, I will give you the good of the land. And now he's promising, I will give you a satisfying water. And it's going to be better than any physical water that you could ever imagine. Let's go back to the start of this chapter. Let me hurry quickly and give you some important truths. Look at verse 3. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. He met this woman by divine appointment. He must needs go through Samaria. And there's some important must in the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, a man must be born again. He said, I've got to go through Samaria. He met this woman according to divine appointment. I pray today that somebody would meet him here according to divine appointment. I pray today that somebody watching by television, that they would stop dead in their tracks and realize that the water giver, the one that can satisfy your thirst, he's on the scene. And this is not by happenstance. This is not coincidental. This is providential. You've got a divine appointment with the giver of life, the sustainer of life. So he was there by divine appointment. And listen to what happens in verse 5. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. There he is. Again, old Joseph showing up that many years later. Now Jacob's well was there and Jesus therefore being wearied in his journey. I love that. Under line and he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. God became a man and he walked in human flesh. He's a man of sorrow acquainted with our grief. A great high priest that knows the struggles of the flesh. Nobody knows the devil's lying to you. Nobody's ever been through what I've been through. The devil's lying to you. And again that funeral song that I kind of uh, don't appreciate that much. Go rest high on the mountain. Son we know that your life down here was troubled. I got news for you. All of our our lives down here are going to be troubled. If you're not facing trouble today, you're going to face it tomorrow. And sometimes they sing that song in a funeral, and you know what the person did? They brought a lot of that trouble on themselves. They could have walked with God, known God, lived for God, been obedient to God, and avoided a lot of trouble. I don't know about you. I've got enough trouble. I don't want my disobedience to cause me any more trouble than what I've already got. Can I get an amen right there? I don't need any more. It continually knocks at my door and I hear it with every phone call. It goes to the very belly of me. Another word of trouble. I can't wait until we're free from this old trouble-filled world. What a day that's going to be. And so he was weird. He knows about her trouble. Then cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. And then saith the woman of Samaria, Watch her progressive illumination. Follow me real quickly. Progressive illumination. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew? That's how she started. You are a Jewish man. Underline it. Thou being a Jew... 
Ask us, drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Good news, lady. This is not your average Jew. Good news, lady. He is a Jew. And we're going to see that in a moment. But he's God in Jewish flesh. And he's no respecter of persons. He has no partiality and no prejudice whatsoever. Whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So it all began with the fact that she recognized him and recognized him there in his disposition, in his countenance, in his ethnicity, that he was a Jew. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. There he is. He's a giver. He's a giver. Over and over in the Gospel of John, he gives for God so loved the world that he gave. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast that, that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Is he greater, dear lady? If he wanted to, he could just tell that water to jump up in the water pitcher. Don't you know who you're talking to? This progressive illumination, it's going to move along. Are you greater? Oh my gracious, in Matthew 12 and 6, Jesus said, I'm greater than the temple. In 12 and 41, he said, I'm greater than Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights. I'm going to be in the grave for three days and three nights and I'm going to be raised again. I'm greater than Solomon. 12 and 42, he's greater than Abraham. In the 8th chapter, 53 through 58, he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and he was what? He was glad because when he was yonder on Mount Moriah and God would allow him to give Isaac, he knew that a greater sacrifice was on its way and God gave Abraham the feeling and then in the third chapter of the book of Hebrews the Bible says in verse 3 that Jesus is worthy of even more glory than Moses greater than the temple, greater than Jonah, greater than Solomon, greater than Abraham, greater than Jacob worthy of more glory than even Moses I tell you great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. I will extol thee my God and King and I will bless thy name forever and forever. Every day I will bless thee and I will praise thy name forever and forever for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is absolutely unsearchable. We can't even discover how great God really is and he shall be great and you're going to call his name Jesus and he's going to save his people from their sin and he's going to be given the throne of his father David and of his kingdom there'll be no end he's greater above and beyond and Jesus answered and said unto her whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life and the woman saith unto him sir Give me that water that I thirst not and neither come hither to draw. It was the sixth hour. It was three in the afternoon. She was gathering water and carrying water in the heat of the day. That wasn't the right time. Early in the morning. Early in the morning, that was the time. But the other women were there. And she had to go in order to be able to be the recluse that she had become. She had to sneak out in the heat of the day so she wouldn't have to face the women. They're talking, they're tweeting, they're Facebooking. She had to come at another time just in order to stay away from them. Listen to verse 15. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me that water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. Write it down. Look here who you are. No conversion without conviction. And people are trying to be converted without being convicted that you're a sinner. 
and you stand in need of a Savior, and you got to face your sin. you got to face what's causing you not to believe. And so here it goes. Listen to what he says. Go and call thy husband. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that thou saidest, you said it truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet, a Jew in verse 9, but now he's one that knows the future knows the past. He's got insight. He can discern like no one else. I perceive that you're a prophet. Dear sweetheart, let me tell you something. He's more than a prophet. He is the prophet. He's the one that Abraham pointed to. He's the one that Isaac pointed to. He's the one that Isaiah prophesied and Jeremiah prophesied of. He's greater than Hosea and Joel and Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nam, Abacah, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. He is the one that every prophetic finger pointed to. He's the prophet among all the prophets. He is the final prophet. No other. Done. Seal it up. This is the final and complete revelation of God in this man. Watch her now. This happens in soul winning. Can you stay with me just a moment longer? She changes direction on him and tries to get Jesus into a religious argument. Watch this. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, Salvation is of the Jews. Underline it. Don't you miss this verse of Scripture. Don't you go away on me right now. You pay close attention and underline what he says in the close of the 22nd verse. Salvation is of the Jews. I'm going to explain to you what it means to worship in spirit and truth. And you're going to see how the world and the modern day church has been so far from this. Listen to me. Don't give me any of that regard or give me any of that information or esteem or any type of of some of these contemporary pastors and some of these modernists that have strayed and compromised going around to other religions and telling them we all serve the same God. Don't tell me that a Baptist minister, a Christian minister, a Bible-believing preacher would go into an Islamic forum and tell Islam that we are all serving the same God. Let me tell you something, dear friend. That is a misnomer. That is deception. That is anarchy. That is heresy to the highest order. We're not serving the same God as Allah of Islam. I'm telling you, our God had a son, and the son was always with him, and the son was eternal, and the son was not born in eternity, but the son was born into time and took upon him a robe of flesh. Our God is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we've got some of the biggest named preachers in America running around and getting on talk shows and telling those hosts that we all believe in the same God and we're all heading in the same direction. If your God is not of Jewish descent, if he didn't work through the Jewish people, we got our Bible from the Jews. We got our Savior from the Jews. The early Christians, the first Christians were Jewish. And if your religion is not steeped in Judaism with a Jewish background, you don't have the faith. The faith that has been once and for all delivered unto the saints that we earnestly contend for. It has a Jewish emphasis, a Jewish background. And if yours don't have that, you're in a false doctrine. You're in a live hell that's going to send you to hell. I'll stand on this and preach this until the Lord comes back and let everyone that says anything other that we're all serving the same God, let them be damned forever and forever and forever. Let them be damned. Come around after and I'll tell you about some that you love that are saying that. And some that you're reading after that says that. We're all serving the same God. Islam, Judaism, Christianity lie out of hell. And it's going to send people to hell. So watch this now and you'll see something. Listen to what he says. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. Salvation is of the Jews. He came into his own, John 1 and 10. He was in the world. The world was made by him. The world knew him not. He came into his own. His own received him not. But to as many as did receive him. It's through the Jewish nation. And if you don't understand that, then you're off biblically. 
He was promised through the tribe of Judah. He is the lineage of David. It is all steeped in Judaism. But we know in this wonderful day of grace. Now watch. But the hour cometh now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, now, now. Let's stop. All this pseudo emotions that we see in churches today. Sound and lights and all this rig. Trying to work up a spirit. Let me show you what it means to worship in spirit and truth. He's saying to this Samaritan woman. Even though most Jews regard you as a half-breed, as one that is almost considered a bastard in Judaism, I want you to understand, dear lady, that you're going to have to come to this formulation. You're going to have to submit yourself under the authority of a national order that you don't agree with and you don't necessarily like. And in your spirit you're going to have to be submissive to the truth that salvation came to us through the Jews. Now, I know a lot of people that are saying, oh, spirit and truth, that's a feeling. That's goosebumps. That ain't got nothing to do with what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, woman, listen to me. Don't change the subject now. You tried to get me going down the other road when you said, I perceive, sir, that you're a prophet, and now let's argue about the place of worship. Jesus said there's not going to be a particular place of worship because I'm getting ready to change everything from buildings and boundaries that you can worship anywhere, you can worship everywhere if you will submit yourself to the fact that Jesus came to us through the books of the Old Testament and they all spoke of him and that's the way that we recognize him as a Jew. That the world is disdained and hated and persecuted. And why? Because there she was, the Jewish nation in Revelation chapter 12, getting ready to give birth to a man child. And who was there? The old dragon, ready to devour the child of the woman there when it was clothed with the moon. There she is, the nation of Israel, bringing forth the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And there the old dragon was ready to devour him as soon as he was born and there Herod made the decree that all the babies of Bethlehem be killed and it never stopped even the winds and the waves tried to kill him but Jesus there he is that climbing vine invincible unstoppable ever climbing ever growing and today he remains to be the life giver and when we submit to that watch this joy in worship why have we got such joy in worship around here We've got the spirit of submission that Jesus came to us through the Jews. And I preach the types and the shadows of the Old Testament, and I reveal how they've been fulfilled in the New Testament. God meets with us every time. See what I'm talking about? But, oh, let me tell you something. There's a lot of people, they are so anti-Semitic. And that's what's going on in the Middle East right now. And you see, they're after the Jewish nation. Why? Because greater than just the Jewish nation. They're after the Savior that was produced and brought forth through the Jewish nation. The battle is still going on right now that we see in Revelation chapter 12. The dragon trying to devour the man-child that was given to us through Israel, trying to destroy him, still trying to destroy him today. But I got good news. He's coming to destroy them. And Oasis wants a total Islamic state from the northern part of Africa all the way through the Mideast and up to Turkey and to the borders of Russia. They want to control the dollar. said, it's not possible. It's possible, dear friend. But it's also possible, according to this word of prophecy, that Jesus is coming to put down that rebellion and to take the throne of his father David in Jerusalem and to reign forevermore. That's what it means to worship in spirit. You've got to submit yourself to the truth of the Scripture that Jesus was given to us through the Jewish nation. That has to be in my spirit. If that's not in my spirit, I can't even approach God. See what I'm talking about? And that's truth that I walk in. That Jesus, through Joseph, he's represented as the climbing vine, the life-giving vine. Will you ever forget that now? 
We, you say, no, preacher, that's still a worked up feeling. Let me tell you something. Me and God gets along in this book. I don't need a band. I, don't, I love you. Sister Rogers, great. In this choir, great. I love them. I don't need the choir. I don't need the piano playing. I don't need tickly music. I don't need a southern gospel group. I don't need a contemporary group. Me and God gets along in that word, and I submit myself, Jesus, this is you. This is you, Jesus. I'm holding to the truth of this. Jesus, you said, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I see Jesus in Joseph. Come down to Egypt. Even in this whole world, I'll give you, I'll give you the good of the land. I'll nourish you. I'll sustain you when I see him as the shepherd and the stone of Israel. I get so happy and joyful in that and it's not a worked up feeling. It's based on who he is, what he's done, where he's at, what he's doing now and what he's getting ready to do in the future. 